Hello, Anatomy students. <clears throat> we are going to continue on with <clears throat> uh, skeletal muscle contraction. Um, we end it uh, talking about the mechanisms for skeletal muscle contraction. And now we're going to look at uh, um, relaxation uh, and energy sources for contraction. Um, some of them you'd be familiar with. Uh, the other area we'll end with is the oxygen supply. Uh, for muscle contraction and uh, cellular respiration itself. So if we look at relaxation, uh, basically the me mechanism then is the reverse of everything that has occurred for contraction itself. So in relaxation, um, the first thing that would happen is an enzyme and that enzyme would be acetylcholinesterase. And acetylcholinesterase is going to um, be present in the neuromuscular junction. <clears throat> and it's going to immediately destroy the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Um, and ultimately what that would lead to then, the motor end plate uh, is no longer going to be stimulated. So, so uh, it cannot cause continuous muscle, muscle contraction then. Um, the calcium ions are transported uh, from the sarcoplasm back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum of the muscle fibers and the linkages between the actinomyosin are going to be broken. Um, binding will be will be uh, prevented. Um, lastly the muscle fibers will then go into a relaxation state. So that is how a muscle would relax. I think on your textbook page there is the um, video clips that will show. All right, energy sources for contraction. Ultimately, we know that uh, energy is used to power the interaction between actinomycin, and that energy comes from ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So. In our cells, ATP must be generated continuously if contraction is to continue. There are three pathways in which ATP can be regenerated. Uh, the three pathways include uh, a coupled reaction with creatine phosphate, uh, abbreviated CP. And then you have anaerobic cellular respiration and aerobic cellular respiration. The latter two are the ones that you already are familiar with. The coupled reactions of creatine phosphate. Um, you've heard of creatine in muscles. Um, a, a lot of athletes may have taken like a creatine supplement. So you'll see how that plays a role a little bit in this coupling reaction. So ultimately, coupled reaction with creatine phosphate. Let's look at the first one. Um, creatine phosphate itself, it stores energy that quickly converts ADP to ATP. Um, what you have is, is uh, creatine uh, phosphate plus ADP is going to yield creatine plus ADP. So creatine phosphate uh, is going to lose that phosphate group and add it to the ADP molecule to make ATP. Ultimately, uh, the muscles do store a lot of creatine phosphate. And this coupling reaction allows for about 10 seconds worth of ATP. So it's, it's, it's a quick turnover of energy for the muscle cells. So the next one would be uh, cellular respiration. Um, cellular respiration we have gone over in detail in biology. Um, just a little bit of looking at it now. Um, oxygen supply and cellular respiration. Remember that uh, true cellular respiration is the uh, aerobic phase, but there is the anaerobic phase, and the anaerobic phase is going to occur in the absence of oxygen. Uh, remember, our two areas of the cell that we are concerned with here are the cytoplasm and the mitochondria. So uh, anaerobic respiration occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell, um, the steps are called <clears throat> glycolysis. Um, the steps occur in the cytoplasm of the cell, and it's going to result in the reproduction of <clears throat> a pyruvic acid and two ATP. 
So what would happen is, um, if you look here, in the absence of oxygen, pyruvic acid gets converted to lactic acid. Um, that will eventually lead to uh, muscle fatigue, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, th the key thing here in anaerobic respiration is that during glycolysis, if you recall, you regenerate that NAD+. Plus. So you get uh, NAD+, plus that will come back in and be able to pick up electrons to form NADH. And ultimately what that allows is as long as something's able to come back into glycolysis to pick up those electrons, you are able to keep continuing to form those two ATP molecules. Now, in most organisms that are very small, this process is sufficient for energy supply. However, in larger, more complex organisms, we need something beyond anaerobic respiration to power us, and that's where aerobic respiration would come in. In aerobic respiration, what we see happening is we get anywhere from 36 to 30, 34 to 36 ATP molecules out of that process. So aerobic respiration occurs when oxygen is available. And at the end of glycolysis, pyruvate then would enter into a transition step and then go through this uh, citric acid cycle. Um, the citric acid cycle is going to pump out a bunch of electron carrier molecules, if you remember. That would be NADH and FADH2. It's all those electron carrier molecules, the two NADHs produced from glycolysis, um, the uh, NADH2, the, the NADH and the FADH2s that you get out of the citric acid cycle, that gang, then go to this electron transport chain where you're going to have oxidative phosphorylation occur and you're going to pump out all those ATP molecules. So um, aerobic respiration occurs in that mitochondria, it produces the most ATP, and we have uh, myoglobin that is going to help store extra oxygen to allow this process to take place. So in repaying the oxygen debt, um, the, the debt is the amount of oxygen necessary to support A, um, the conversion of lactic acid to glucose, B, to resynthesize ATP and creatine phosphate, and C, to return uh, the, the return of the ATP, yeah, the return of tissue and um, blood oxygen back to levels to pre-exercise levels. So oxygen debt is the amount of oxygen of, uh, needed by liver cells to use uh, the accumulated lactic acid to produce glucose and to restore muscle ATP and creatine phosphate concentrations back to... Uh, pre-exercise levels and you can see this oxygen depth cycle back in here because remember lactic acid gets converted back to pyruvate in the liver muscle fatigue uh, we know that from anaerobic respiration and any uh, strenuous exercise uh, muscle fatigue is a state of physiological inability to contract that muscle. If no oxygen is available in the muscle cells to complete aerobic respiration, pyruvic acid is converted to lactic acid, which in animals causes muscle fatigue and soreness. Um, commonly caused from uh, muscle fatigue is commonly caused from decreased blood flow, um, ion imbalances across the sarcolemma, and accumulation of lactic acid. Ultimately what, would that, ultimately, what that leads to is it, it could cause uh, a cramp, and that's a sustained involuntary muscle contraction. We'll look a little bit at uh, threshold stimuluses, stimuli um, a, a little later. I think that comes into play in Section 9.4. So um, the results from a relative deficit of ATP and or the accumulation of lactic acid is going to decrease uh, the pH levels in the muscles, um, therefore causing that soreness there. The final thing would be heat production. Um, heat production, almost half of the energy released during muscle contraction is lost to heat, um, which helps maintain our body temperature at 37 degrees Celsius. Excessive heat loss is through many 
negative feedback mechanisms um, that we discussed in chapter one. So if you forget what a negative feedback loop is, please uh, revisit that. But it includes sweating, dilation of the superficial blood vessels, um, increased breathing rate, and increased heart rate. So blood transport, blood is the transport system for many things in our body. And one of those things also includes heat. So that is today. We are not going to continue on to muscular responses. Um, that is where we do see the threshold stimulus and muscle contraction um, all come into play there. So um, we'll stop there for today. I hope you enjoyed this lecture a little on the shorter side, but that is fine. Um, we'll continue on um, and start actually breaking down those muscles. So have a nice day, everybody.